So thanks for having me. Um, I, I've been at Goddard for about 25 years now, and I'll admit I'm I, not doing Arctic research, mostly uh, tropical meteorology, tropical cyclones, but some uh, mid-latitude uh, winter storms. And uh, I'll also say I'm joined here by my dog who heard the um, smoke alarm beep and uh, came running down terrorized by the alarm. So hopefully she won't be a distraction during the meeting here. Um, so let me put it in full screen mode. All right, so I'll, I'll talk about the uh, atmosphere observing system, which is really trying to uh, build on the legacy of the A train uh, and in particular the cloud aerosol and precipitation measurements that were part of that mission. Uh, this mission comes out of the 2017 NASA Earth Science Decadal Survey. Um, and I'm not sure how familiar most of you are with the Decadal Survey, but they had recommended several what they called designated observables, the high priority observables for the next decade. And among those were aerosols and clouds, convection, and precipitation. Uh, and so this mission is, is the, the means by which we are trying to implement those designated observables. Uh, and the people shown here are uh, the project science team, including Emily, who will talk about uh, applications right after me. Uh, and uh, I, I only plan for about 10, you know, maybe around 12 minutes of presentation. I wanted to build in enough time for questions and discussion, particularly at the end. So if you have a, a question, you can go ahead and interrupt me. Uh, just want to give you a, a high level overview of the science of AOS. Um, the Decadal Survey had identified a number of science objectives related to aerosols and uh, clouds convection and precipitation or CCP. And many of these fit within three main themes, which are climate feedback and sensitivity, convective storm formation processes and air pollution processes and distributions. Uh, and our team in, in a study that we did from late 2018 to early 21, looking at architectures, we sort of pulled those objectives together and, and tried to find ones that we thought we could implement some a specific set of objectives that follow those themes. And so in the green, which is the climate feedback and sensitivity, we have cloud feedbacks as um, identified in terms of high and low clouds and cold clouds. So more or less polar clouds where, where you have mixed phase or, or frozen clouds uh, near the surface, um, and then aerosol direct and indirect effects. Uh, convective storms is, is kind of on its own, uh, it's uh, focused on relating uh, convective storm microphysical properties to the dynamics of those storms, uh, with the dynamics coming from uh, Doppler radars. And then the aerosol objectives, which are focused on um, aerosol properties and profiles, um, as well as uh, aerosol movement through the atmosphere, so from emission to short and long range transport and eventual removal. And we use those objectives as the basis for identifying you know, what geophysical variables are needed to answer those objectives or address those objectives. That formed the basis of a science traceability matrix. Uh, and ultimately, we flowed the need for those uh, geophysical variables to a set of measurements uh, and built the architecture by looking at a range of uh, instrument capabilities that could address those measurement needs. Um, and as I mentioned, so from late 2018 to early 21, we did this architecture study um, using, we had put out an RFI to collect information about a variety of uh, technologies that were available um, in the, you know, that were expected to be relatively mature by the early to mid part of this decade. Um, all, overall, we constructed on the order of about 100 architectures. We evaluated those using what's called the value framework, where we did quantitative assessments of the quality of the observations that would come from the different instruments. And we eventually whittled that down to um, an architecture that uh, headquarters accepted. It was a dual orbit uh, architecture, similar to what's shown here. Um, so an inclined orbit to go after diurnally varying processes, uh, particularly if you're focused on convection, and high clouds, you know, that has a very strong diurnal component. Uh, and, and that's what this mission, that uh, project is targeted for. 
Uh, and then a polar observatory, uh, which is really geared toward globally distributed observations uh, and geared toward the, the highest quality measurements that we could um, provide and, and noting that we really wanted synergy of those measurements to get the best possible estimates um, of these geophysical variables. Uh, we took that architecture through pre-formulation over the last year or so. Um, we had to make some descopes um, as costs, um, as we refined the costs and the overall costs went higher. Most of those descopes were to the inclined project, not the polar. Um, and then the concept that's shown here is what we took to our mission con or concept review in May, which we uh, readily passed. Uh, so this is the architecture we're moving forward with now. We're getting ready to move toward our key decision point A review um, in December. We are uh, headquarters ha had start, started up a, an independent review board to assess all the designated observable missions. They've received the recommendations from that IRB um, and they're still evaluating those. So we haven't heard whether there are gonna be recommended, recommended changes to the architecture. It's certainly possible, and that's why you'll see down at the bottom here where we say it's pre-decisional. There are, it's possible that some aspects of this architecture could change. I'm not gonna talk about the, the inclined orbit uh, later in this talk, so I'll just briefly summarize it here. Um, it, it includes a JAXA KU band wide swath precipitation radar with nadir Doppler capability. Uh, that's on one spacecraft, a, a Japanese observatory. Uh, the NASA observatory will have a backscattered LIDAR that's comparable in capability to Calypso, but in a smaller, more affordable package. And then on both of the satellites, we will have uh, tandem, we'll have microwave radiometers um, with frequencies ranging from 89 to 325 gigahertz. Um, and, and those will be separated by about two minutes. And the goal there is not only to characterize high clouds, and to some extent precipitation processes, but using the time rate of change of the brightness temperatures to infer something about the dynamics of the storms, uh, given that the change in brightness temperature reflects a change in the microphysics over that short time period, that tells you something about the vertical ice mass flux within the storms. Um, the polar capabilities I'll describe in the, in the slides that are coming up, and I'll just note that the inclined orbit is gonna launch no earlier than mid-2028, uh, and the polar uh, component would be no, uh, no earlier than um, 2030, late 2030. So let, let's talk a bit about some of the capabilities in polar, and we'll start with uh, clouds and precipitation. Uh, we have uh, a couple of instruments here to highlight. One is a Doppler radar that uh, is expected to be built by JPL. Um, it's W band and KA band. Uh, the W band is, is sort of similar to CloudSat in being able to profile clouds, but it doesn't have the exact same capabilities. Um, we made some trades uh, due to a number of reasons in trying to advance the science in some ways and then being cost constrained in others. Uh, but one of the things that we really wanted to do was to be able to sample closer to the surface and just to uh, give an example here on the left, this, these are uh, low clouds as observed by a ground-based radar. And you can see the cloud tops are just above one kilometer. Cloud base varies from about 700 meters uh, and, and then lower, and you have some areas of precipitation within the cloud. Uh, this is a simulation of what CloudSat would see. So uh, because of its coarse vertical resolution, you get some pixels. Um, extending the cloud vertically uh, when it's a, actually above cloud top. The cloud, the cloud boundaries are indicated by these dots. There are about two range gates within the cloud. And then due to uh, surface clutter effects, you end up with this blind zone down low where you can't see what happens in the lower layers. Uh, whereas with the AOS uh, radar, we sacrifice a bit of sensitivity, at least down low, uh, to be able to profile closer to the surface. So we're primarily seeing areas uh, of very light precipitation, uh, very fine vertical resolution of a few hundred meters. And, in, uh, and then you can also see down to about uh, 300 meters or so, uh, these precipitation shafts. Uh, once we get above the boundary layer, the sensitivity improves quite a bit. 
Uh, still less than CloudSat, uh, but not nearly as, as bad as what you, you see in the lowest one kilometer. And again, this is just due to surface clutter effects that make profiling in the boundary layer quite difficult. Now, from a precipitation standpoint, uh, yeah, in particular snowfall, this W-band radar is going to be great because you'll, you're generally going to have higher reflectivities and we will get uh, profiles down to a few hundred meters. So your blind zone is, is much uh, shallower than it would be with uh, CloudSat and, and other typical radars. It would be good vertical resolution. And by having W-band combined with KA-band, we will be able to get some estimates of the particle sizes uh, using uh, dual frequency approaches. Now, both of these radars will be uh, will have Doppler capability uh, using what's called the displaced phase center antenna approach. It's basically instead of one antenna, it's two, and that helps to remove um, errors associated with the spacecraft motion and non-uniform beam filling. And I'm just using an example here. It's actually radar data from the IMPACTS airborne campaign for the KA band frequency, and it's been degraded in resolution to be kind of comparable to the AOS resolution. Uh, but you'll be able to see through the Doppler data uh, phase changes from frozen precip to liquid. Um, and with the improved Doppler accuracy um, with the DPCA approach, we, we expect to be able to see some of the vertical motions, for example, when there's embedded convection. In this case, there was this elevated convection above the, the frontal zone in this snow event, or well, rain event. Uh, it was snow elsewhere in the storm. Uh, but that kind of gives you a sense of the capabilities we'll have from a Doppler perspective. And then up in the upper right is uh, an example of the passive microwave data. We'll have frequencies in the polar orbit from 89 to 700 gigahertz, uh, primarily 89 or 113, 183, 325, and then 640 to 700. We're hoping also to get channels near like about 160 to 240 uh, for better um, measurement of snowfall at the surface, uh, at least at mid-latitudes. Uh, and this is a it's a simulation of a convective system, but you can see how the scattering by the ice particles varies by frequency, uh, where typically you can distinguish the more intense ice amounts uh, at these lower frequencies, but you need these higher frequencies to see the full extent of the, the cloud shield. Uh, this is just an example from the LIDAR. So the LIDAR uh, will have two wavelengths uh, at 532 nanometers. Uh, we're uh, expecting it to be a high spectral resolution LIDAR, um, which means that it has an, an HSRL filter that helps you to separate the particulate backscatter from the molecular backscatter. And then we'll have a backscatter channel at 1064. Uh, there are many advantages to having that HSRL. Uh, we expect to have much better uh, signal to noise than Calypso. Um, but with the, uh, with the backscatter LiDAR, you're basically solving for two unknowns with one equation. So it's an under-constrained problem and you have to make some assumptions uh, about the, the ratio of the backscatter to extinction. Uh, with the HSRL, you're basically getting two pieces of information, two equations for two unknowns so you can get a much more accurate uh, retrieval of the uh, aerosol uh, total particulate uh, backscatter and extinction, uh, including in situations where there's at least thin uh, overlying clouds, which is a, a problematic area for Calypso. Uh, we also expect to have uh, to do uh, tenuous or faint aerosol much better. And the example that's shown here uh, is airborne data in the upper left uh, from an experiment that was uh, in the Arctic region. Uh, you can see the, the latitude here ranging from about 71 to 74 or 5 degrees. Uh, and it's showing aerosol over a cloud layer. And you can see some more intense aerosol and then these very faint aerosol layers. This is what Calypso saw in this event. You can sort of make out this aerosol layer here. but uh, And the boxes indicate uh, areas that were identified by the Calypso algorithm, but there's a lot of noise and, and pretty weak signal. Uh, and this is a, a simulation that uh, Langley did of the uh, HSRL uh, instrument from space. And you can see it does a, a much better job of detecting and, and uh, quantifying the uh, aerosols in this region. And this will be very useful for looking at the direct radiative impacts of these faint aerosol layers 
uh, and can also be important if you're looking at uh, cloud aerosol interactions. A uh, few other instruments in this polar orbit. One is a multi-wavelength, multi-angle polarimeter. Um, this will allow for fairly accurate retrievals of aerosol optical depth, absorption, and particle size. Uh, and also, um, at one of the wavelengths with the multi-angles, you get uh, cloud bow measurements, which gives you information on uh, cloud particle phase and particle size and variance. Uh, the swath is expected to be at least 300 kilometers. We're certainly hoping to get a, a bit wider. And this is just an example of AOD uh, from the HARP instrument, but it's at least conceptually uh, similar to what we would expect to get uh, from AOS. And, and not only will the, the polarimeter observations by themselves have a lot of value, but we are anticipating having combined polarimeter LIDAR retrievals that use the best information from both sensors to get the best retrievals. And then from the Canadian Space Agency, we have a long wave and far infrared uh, imaging radiometer that will be on the same spacecraft as the instruments I was just talking about. They'll all be looking down. And then on a CSA provided spacecraft, they'll have two limb imaging uh, sensors, one for aerosols and one for moisture that will help to characterize the upper tropospheric, lower stratospheric uh, water vapor and aerosol properties. Uh, that spacecraft will be following the, the larger spacecraft by about five minutes due to the geometry of the viewing. And, and so from tick fire, uh, we'll get uh, cloud optical depth and cloud particle size information, as well as some information on uh, long wave radiant forcing. Uh, and again, with uh, the uh, ALI, you get the ex uh, aerosol extinction profile and information on particle size and so on. Uh, and this information will be great to have in combination with the LIDAR and the radar in terms of connecting uh, the cloud processes with these aerosol and, and moisture processes. We're also going to have a suborbital campaign that will focus on low clouds, convection and high clouds, and aerosol cloud uh, interactions. These campaigns are, are sort of earth venture suborbital type, if you're familiar with those, you know, really large campaigns, uh, probably three of them um, spanning the years after the launch of the two uh, projects in the mission. Um, most of these will probably not be in the Arctic region, but we have been looking at using data from a ground site at uh, uh, Qualoit, um, Canada. And uh, we're considering the possibility of, of at least maybe a limited airborne campaign there, maybe just a single aircraft with a limited set of instruments uh, where we could have combine the, air, the uh, airborne and, and ground-based data. Uh, but that's still to be defined in, in the years ahead. So, in summary here, uh, yeah, I think AOS will deliver improved measurements for snowfall with the dual frequency radar, uh, detection of mixed phase clouds from the polarimeter and the LIDAR, and then the aerosol profiles and properties from the polarimeter and LIDAR, uh, as well as uh, with some of the CSA instruments. And I'm really excited about the CSA uh, contribution to this uh, mission. I think it really helps to fill in some gaps, particularly related to the upper troposphere, lower stratosphere. Uh, that'll be a high interest, certainly to the convection community, but I'm sure to many other communities as well. Uh, and I, I, I would imagine you have questions for me, but I have some questions for you as well in terms of what some of the major scientific issues are that a AOS might be able to help address, what you see as some of the key benefits, and, and maybe what measurements uh, are viewed as having the highest value um, to Arctic science. So with that, I'll stop there. And, and maybe before we go to Emily, we can see if there's if there are any questions. Uh, Scott, this is David Bromwich. Um, one question that I have is the repeat time of the measurements. These seem to be relatively narrow swath instruments. So can you talk about that, please? Yeah, we haven't settled on the exact repeat time. It'll, it might end up being comparable to cloud set and clip. So, so a lot of these measurements are um, nadir or near nadir, uh, at least the active measurements are. And so it's not like you're 
trying to get broad coverage of the observations. Over time, you, you want to sample more of the globe and so that the trade-off is uh, getting broader coverage and making sure you don't have holes if you're trying to aggregate data uh, like on a monthly time scale, you don't want to have gaps globally. Um, but you, you, know, you might not want your revisit rate to be too long either. So that's one of the things that we're still looking at here in trade it, in phase A is what the, the best timing is for a repeat cycle uh, of those observations. But I think if I recall correctly, CloudSat and Calypso are about two weeks for their repeat cycle and, and we it, might it's, be comfortable. It's better in the Arctic, right? Um, right, yeah. I mean, how many, it's 90 minutes per orbit in a polar orbit. And so how many times, how many times a day is that? That's um, 19 think, or something. I 16 remember. or 17 a day, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. I, it's about that. Yeah, I, th I want to say it was like 15 or, or 16 or so. Yeah, so we'll have really good coverage in the Arctic um, compared to everywhere else. It It is a function of latitude, isn't it? Yes. Uh, so exactly. the highest latitude that you go to has a lot of coverage, you know, and as you slack off, let's say, to 70 north, you've got, I don't know, every few days, I would think, something like that. Yeah, yes. I think our biggest problems will be down in the tropics when we're trying to look at tropical convection, um, and we're more likely to have larger gaps down in those regions. Okay. So I was just curious, uh, you, it seemed like you're hinting that uh, HSRL is coming out of Langley and the uh, polarimeter is a Goddard instrument. Is that correct? Or are these things still not decided until you get past phase eight? So we expect the passive instruments, the radiometer, the, the passive microwave radiometer and the polarimeter to be competed uh, to industry. And the LIDAR at this point may be a hybrid of Langley and competed. Um, we, we we haven't yet had our acquisition strategy meeting with headquarters to determine the best path forward for acquiring things. So certain instruments are directed. The the JP we suspect that the the polar radar will go to JPL. The inclined lidar will go to Goddard. Um, and I'm trying to remember uh, some of the others. The um, we have the the contributed instruments from other. Um, uh, countries and, and so most most of the passives are going to be competed and, and that was really the desire of headquarters was to compete as much to industry as possible uh, unless the capabilities were so unique to the NASA centers or they were viewed as sort of tier one in terms of capabilities just one question Scott this is Javier from UAF so hey uh, the the microwave radiometers actually are direct detection or are um, um, uh, what's the name? Uh, heterodyne detection. That I can't tell you. That's getting more into the engineering than I'm used okay. to wondering. <laughs> if I had Ian, our, our instrument scientist on here, mm -hmm. he would be able to tell you right away. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so far, I mean, uh, actually, I have one microwave radiometer here sitting. But um, what we have seen is. Uh, um, change in the periodicity if you of, of the currents of precipitation and changes significant changes in the intensity so changes in occurrence and changes in intensity if if you want some answer to those questions that's what we have been seeing so we are that's looking a, at yeah that's occurrence and intensity of what of the snow precipitation oh, the precipitation over how many years well, I mean, uh, over, over the last uh, probably six years, we have seen uh, warming events, uh, increasing cyclonic advections, um, and may eventually have been some other collected to some other connected to some other lower latitude uh, circulation patterns, and eventually, probably, uh, changes in the microphysical composition to actually trigger such uh, tremendous precipitation events. Here we have uh, buildings that have collapsed in, in Fairbanks. Yeah. Well, Jack, so one thing, here, actually. 
Yeah, one of the things that we wanted to do is provide some continuity with the A train. So we have the Polar Observatory uh, having the same equatorial cross time as CloudSat and Calypso, so that at least to some extent the two records can be combined to look at some of the trends. You know, they're not, they're not going to be exactly the same in terms of the measurements, but hopefully it allows for some characterization of, of these yeah. trends. Yeah. Yep. Right. I had a question about uh, about the cloud phase, which since you asked about some of the major scientific issues uh, and how important they are, I mean, to me, that's a really important one. It's a pretty, uh, it's, it's a really it's a large uncertainty in the climate models. And so I was curious whether the new uh, instruments, how, how well they're gonna be able to differentiate between uh, phases compared to the instruments now. So with the LIDAR, it'll probably be comparable to uh, Calypso in terms of its uh, ability to identify at least super cold liquid water at cloud top. Um, you know, if, if you can't penetrate the cloud, you're not gonna see further in, but it at least have comparable capability there. Um, and I don't think that the SNR will make as much of a difference as it does for aerosols. The polarimeter likely adds information because uh, particle cloud top particle phase, it will be one of the parameters that they can derive. Uh, again, it's, it's kind of limited to cloud top. It's just difficult to determine phase deeper into the cloud, um, but at least the polarimeter will give you some sense of the spatially varying pattern of cloud phase and particle size and, and how that relates to the cloud structure, and, and, you know, both in the vertical and horizontal. Okay, thanks. All right, so we can move on to um, applications with Emily, and then if there's additional questions after her, we can uh, continue the discussion. So next up is Emily. All right, so I'm Emily Barron. I'm at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center down in Huntsville, Alabama, and I work within the Short-Term Prediction Research and Transition Center. Okay, so go ahead to the next slide. So what is AOS applications? So uh, we have something called the applications impact team that we actually started at the same time as the science team um, and participated in the mission study so that we could look at potential enabled applications. So as the science team was um, coming up with architectures and potential um, geophysical variables that would be available, we considered those um, and uh, used our expertise in applications to um, come up with some ideas about how the data could be used for societal applications. Um, so a lot of it focuses around improving weather and air quality forecasting, seasonal to subseasonal changes in the future, and um, societal changes resulting from climate change. You can press the space bar, Scott. So here's our high level um, thematic areas where we have applications. So disaster monitoring and modeling. So think um, a lot of precip driven types of applications such as landslides, um, also atmospheric type of um, disasters such as wildfires, uh, volcanic um, uh, smoke and tracking smoke, uh, water resources, infrastructure and development, health um, and air quality, and then of course the weather, air quality, and climate modeling and forecasting. Um, so in the current phase in phase A, we're focusing on the development of project applications plan, meaning how are we going to carry out applications and engage with stakeholders throughout the mission life and starting to recruit early adopters. Um, you can go to the next slide. Typically early adopters are people who are interested in using the data um, or proxy data um, prior to launch. Um, so we have a wide range of um, people who participate in the applications impact team across NASA centers uh, with experience in aerosols and experience in um, weather type of applications. Um, so we do project studies to enhance applications. So looking at latency, um, engaging stakeholders on um, what their needs are for uh, data formats and ideas that they have for applications. We collaborate with the science team to help prioritize algorithms and, and 
um, identify potential near type products um, and stakeholder outreach. So we have seminars and we have focus groups um, that we conduct and we uh, collaborate with the other DO projects, the other missions that are expected to launch around the same time period and with headquarters. Um, there's a link to some of the application seminars um, if you're interested in looking back at some of those and what we've covered. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so under each of our thematic areas, there you can see we have a chart of a um, little bit more specific applications. We actually identified something like 70 potential applications, and then we kind of pared it down and grouped them to areas of maybe about 25, 26 within our five areas. So you can see some um, potential areas that may interest you, maybe related to um, air quality and aerosols and uh, weather forecasting or climate modeling or some of the disaster type of, of events that occur within the Arctic, especially around fires and volcanoes, um, and also with hydrology and some of the landslide modeling and risk. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, so I included this slide for the value of the applications related to the polar orbiting architecture. Um, I have a backup slide for the inclined, but figured I would just focus in here. Um, so one of the things that we are looking forward to is the co-location of the LIDAR and polarimeter um, to provide opportunities for synergistic observations of cloud and aerosol products um, to get some of the context information and also some of the vertical information. Um, there's a lot of users who would really benefit for, from more information in the vertical um, to help them make decisions, whether it's the aviation community related to air traffic and tracking hazards um, or within weather forecasting. Um, a lot of focus because the um, a lot of the instruments are more NADAR pointing um, with not a lot of context, a lot of focus revolves around um, some of the improvements to numerical weather prediction and climate modeling, um, that the data can be really valuable for improving models, developing parameterizations, um, and validating models also. So we do have quite a few early stakeholders that we have engaged with around this type of um, application and area. Um, we're looking forward to enhancement to air quality applications and modeling and forecasting and disaster monitoring and response and novel measurements that inform policy, um, such as health impacts and particles. Um, so we just have a few examples there that uh, range from um, engaging with volcanic ash advisory centers. Uh, we've had a couple engagements with them and, and some of the international DACs to working with NRL and improving um, tropical cyclone uh, forecasting of location intensity that the passive microwave radiometers are really important for that. Um, let's see, and that's my last slide. So if there's any questions that you have, if there's any applications ideas, um, and especially if you have ideas that you have a science idea and you feel like there's an application or a product that could be de developed and flow out of that application idea, we're interested to hear those. Jack, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, I was just wondering if you could back up to that slide that told the people that were already engaged in your planning. And I guess. Yeah, so, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I'm just. <clears throat> I'm not seeing anybody on that list that seems terribly interested in Arctic issues. And there are a lot of pressing ones. And the fact that you're going to get much better coverage at high latitudes than anywhere else seems like maybe there ought to be someone. In maybe someone on this call that be yeah, somehow I, involved in this because i mean all of your examples are great and they're good for society and everything but the issues in the arctic i think are quite a bit different we heard already yeah. about the mixed phase cloud and surface energy balance and you know how fast is all that ice going to melt right and what <laughs> what can you tell us by the role of clouds and the you know, surface energy balance and i think this platform this 
AOS could tell a lot, but there's nobody advocating on your team here to really focus on any of that. Yeah, I think we've had some champions here and there um, where there's been a lot of advocate for uh, being able to look at fires and biomass burning and consideration for how high the inclined orbit would go for us to be able to do that. Um, within the organization that I work in, we've had engagements with the Alaska National Weather Service and they use um, some of the GPM precipitation products very heavily. Um, maybe Brian is on here and can speak. You know, we're, we definitely welcome more input you know, we're, we're also in the process of revising our applications traceability matrix. And so if there's input on how to better represent Arctic type of applications, we're open to that. Right. Well, it'd be great to hear from Brian, but I was thinking that, you know, Javier or David Brown, which might speak to that also was more expertise than I could. So if anybody's got any comments, out of those three at least or anybody else looks like hazel yeah i have a, a comment but it's maybe it's not like a direct response so uh brian or if others want to speak directly to jack's question go ahead yes this is brian duncan yeah we, I, I think that Emily really hit the nail on the head. Is we didn't know what the orbits would actually be and what until uh, rather recently. So this is an issue we need to revisit definitely. And I'm um, and I'll, I'll definitely be bringing this up at the next uh, application impact team call. Yeah, we. I mean, we have a copy of our ATM on the uh, web page that. Uh, that's listed down there, not the events web page, but if you go to the main site, that you know, we're happy to have some of you take a look at it and what we have represented and provide any feedback on anything that we're missing. So, Emily, this is David again being irritating. Um, to get Arctic expertise, uh, you probably have a fair amount from the Canadian Space Agency. So can you talk about the links, you know, how close that is um, for their interests and so on? Um, so we do have one member from Environment Canada, Donna Hay. Um, she is more of a modeler um, and kind of her application interest area is more related to using the data to approve models. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I guess Emily, we could reach out to um, folks at CSA and, and just double check whether there are additional people who might be able to help with applications. One, one really good piece of news we got just recently was that CSA announced that they had secured the funding for their uh, portion of the mission. Um, so we're really happy to hear that. I don't know if that means that they're also able to then start funding people on the application side that maybe were volunteering before. So it, it might be a good time to revisit with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agree. Hazel? Yeah, thanks for the presentations. Um, they were really interesting. And um, I'm not a technical expert on any of these topics, but I just noticed in some of the places where you're where you're looking for impact, uh, like crossover or applications, um, a lot of those are have a really direct tie to IARPIC's next five year plan, which has is going to be developing these priority area groups around things like uh, disaster mitigation and response and human health, in addition to uh, working with some of these like uh, climate modeling and stuff like that. Um, and so I don't have a direct like follow up action, um, but 
we're going to be moving from like having a plan to starting to implement that in the next couple of weeks. And I think that this would be a really interesting thing for the atmosphere team to carry forward or for uh, the AOS group to, to stay involved with IARPIC and um, see if there is some way that we can help you answer some of those questions. Okay. Yeah, we, we certainly have, to the extent Brian is able to participate in some of the IARPIC activities, he could be one of our key links to the community to kind of learn um, how we could connect. I'd have to see if we have somebody on the science side who would be able to connect as well and to look into that. So could I could I ask? Um, this is David again. Uh, I got many questions. Um, so one, the it seems like uh, your <clears throat> satellite, the polar satellite, is in some ways a follow-on to CloudSat and Calypso, um, and I think they've really done a lot with you know their products to make them available. So can you talk a little bit, of, maybe it's early uh, in relation to what you plan to do, but maybe talk a little bit about that aspect of it, which uh, you know gets it out to the, uh, the broader scientific community. Yeah, so you know, with this mission, we emphasized fairly early on that you know applications was, um, really important along with the science, whereas a lot of missions in the past might have started with the science and the applications kind of came along later. So we we actually did a study looking at data latency uh, to see what we, you know, to be able to identify some realistic uh, requirements on getting data to the ground and, and out to users. Um, I think there's a fair bit of it that we can get down and I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. We, we set certain targets for a certain fraction of the data within three hours, a larger fraction within four or five hours, and so on. Um, and some of the the algorithm team, some some of the algorithms kind of um, naturally, you know, work well for applications. You can get them out real quick. With some of the sensors, it it might be a little bit more challenging, like the lidars, and, and what they tend to try to do is. Um, to do uh, an early version of the product that might bring in an analysis instead of some other observations to help get an early estimate of aerosol properties uh, to be followed up later with, with one that's using maybe the more climate quality type of measurement. But the goal will certainly be to try to get uh, some near real time uh, data out as well as um, the climate quality type products. Uh, and we also expect that these, uh, all the data uh, or, or the data management will follow NASA's open science policy that they're developing now. And so all the missions are expected to adopt open science. Uh, so both for the products as well as uh, I think even the algorithms. Um, and, and that's something that's it's in development. We're working with headquarters to, to figure out how all that gets implemented. Um, and a lot of these data sets, not only ours, but uh, from the other designated observable missions will probably be on some Earth data cloud that allows for ready access of all the data sets. Um, but we are still fairly early and, and we'll kind of define that more as we go forward. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and as we engage with communities, one of the things that we can ask them about is preferred formats, preferred visualizations, and you know, there's a, a pretty large range of users um, where you have very sophisticated users who are more modeling agencies or university researchers that can handle the NetCDF data. But one of the things that headquarters had us do is look for um, some users that were non-traditional type of users in um, industry and private company. Um, and so one of, the, one of the things to anticipate is working with those types of users is providing gridded level three, level four products or visualizations that they can 
use pretty easily and use on hand. So those are some of the things that we're thinking on the application side as far as how to um, you know, take the data and make it accessible and usable, usable for um, users who aren't as familiar with it. Yeah, and for those who might not be familiar with some of the terminology, level two would be your retrieved quantities um, in the orbital swaths. Level three is typically gridded to, to some standard uh, grid across the globe. And then level four is assimilated products where you assimilate the op observations into the model and it's actually the resultant model fields that get released as a product. And, and we'll be working very closely with the, the Goddard uh, Global Modeling and Assimilation Office to develop some of those assimilated products. Hey, Scott, I just wanted to advertise that AOS will have a town hall at AGU and also at AMS. So that's a great place to go to get, uh, well, meet, meet Scott and I will be there, but uh, to meet more members of the science team and, and to hear more about, about AOS and to ask these questions. It'd be great to ask these questions again about Arctic um, applications and, and uh, you know, maybe we'll have more information then about the orbit and how many, what the revisit time will be at different latitudes. So. Um, yeah, I'm not sure the have, part will be resolved yet, but uh, some other things might. And we'll we'll also have every quarter we have a community webinar. A community forum. We have actually we might be due for one pretty soon. Uh, we have a, a mailing list uh, for anybody interested in it. Um, uh, if you go to the web page, you can find the link to join the the community uh, list. And, and so we try about once every quarter to just give the community an update on what's happening with the project on the science side um, with the future procurements, you know, once like if RFPs are going to be released anytime soon and things of that sort. Um, and I believe we're probably due in November, but I, I need to get it on the product project management team's yeah. uh, it, vision because I don't think they've been thinking about it lately. And I think they're recorded, and so you can see the last one, um, or go back and see different ones if you want. So, but yeah, we. I will we, the ATU town hall isn't on the web page yet. We, we we just paid a week or so last Friday, I think, the fee to to make it official that it's a town hall, but it hasn't made it onto the web page yet. And looking at the schedule for the AMS meeting yet, I don't really see much of. I, I saw the town hall identified among the list of town halls, but I didn't see town halls actually in the schedule yet. So that might take a little bit longer before they show up. Well, thanks to Scott and Emily, and thanks for the nice questions. Um, um, Lauren, I saw you had your hand raised. Do you have a quick question? Just a super quick comment, maybe for Emily. This is um, since you guys were talking about applications. Um, I was just going to say that I, like Worldview is really great for educational purposes. I imagine this will be integrated probably with Worldview. But I give like periodic presentations to elementary schoolers, you know, for career day at school, and and they use it, and and it's easy for even for elementary school students to use, and it's great. So you know that you know if you could continue to integrate with that, that's a really great product. Yeah, yeah I certainly hope that. We'll, yeah, I, I certainly hope that we'll continue to do that. I, I like to use Worldview for uh, a lot of data sets, and it is a, a readily accessible way of visualizing the data without having to download anything. Um, and, and we will also, over time, produce a set of visualizations that could be used as teaching tools too. I mean, anytime you give a, a talk to a general audience, visualizations, animations are, are great to use, and we hope over time to develop a good suite of visualizations to kind of characterize the science and the type of measurements, the synergy of the measurements and things of that sort. Um, but it'll take some time to generate those pre-launch and then once the mission's going, we'll hopefully generate a number of visualizations. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, Meredith, when's our next meeting? Have we picked a date and a topic yet? I can't remember. 
No, I don't think it has been determined. Okay. So if anyone has a topic they'd like, a, like us to cover at our next meeting, please let us know something that you're interested in, or even if you'd be interested in presenting. But um, when... Um, and I'll, this will be, um, this recorded will be posted on the ARPIC website. All right. Well, th thanks again, everyone. Have a great afternoon. All right. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much.